is the Philadelphia District Attorney's Monday press conference. As always, we are going to address two major points. The first will be the weekly update on gun violence that we have been doing essentially every week since January and that we will continue to do because gun violence at this time is such a crisis nationally and locally. It is worth our attention every single week. We are then going to transition to what is the related and uh, in this instance other issue for today and that is that our grants program has given three more grants we'll be announcing the recipients of those grants and we will be introducing the people who have been doing the work often for free certainly with too little resources for a long time we believe that the long-term solutions to gun violence have a lot to do with prevention and we believe the people in this room know how to do prevention and that is why they have been vetted, they have applied, they have been carefully considered, and they have been selected to receive the, the, these grants. I want to be clear that at this point, the District Attorney's Office has given away close to $250,000 in grants. From we are committed to do more. We've already said that we intend to give out at least $1 million during this year. Every bit of this money is taken uh, during the course of criminal investigations. It is taken in a way that is legal and appropriate, consistent with modern legal standards, and it is being put back into the communities from which it came to make sure that we have a safer society, that we have more prevention, and that we have, among other things, less gun violence. I want at this time to acknowledge some of the people who are here uh, some of whom will speak, but not all. We have with us today Robert Listenby, who is the first assistant in the district attorney's office. His presence today is quite appropriate because of his career spent on addressing the issues of juveniles and juvenile justice in the criminal system, including having been the person in charge of juvenile justice for Barack Obama during his second administration. We have ADA Chesley Lightsey, who is our, the chief of our homicide and non-fatal shooting unit. She is a prosecutor and she works closely with the police, not only on investigations of fatal shootings, but she also uh, works very closely on making sure that there's a very high quality to the prosecutions that we bring for these important cases. We have Myra Maxwell, who is the director of our CARES program, about which we have spoken many times. CARES program works intensively with families that have suffered homicides for the first 45 days. We have Vanessa Young and Tisha Brown, both Vanessa Young and Tisha Brown are co-founders of the Power of Paint Art Academy and Management. They will be here to receive a grant as they have been selected to receive that grant. We'll talk a little bit later about a slogan that they use in connection with their work. We also have with us today Malika Bay, who is the founder of Secor Incorporated. She has been working in the Philadelphia Family Court for many years, but this is one of her passions. And she works closely with some super volunteers who are here as well, Dawn Wilkerson, Yolanda Novoa, and Khadija Diggins Johnson are also here with Ms. Bay. And we have Jacqueline McDonough, who is the founder and executive director of Camp Jameson. Um, all three of these organizations have some interesting slogans and statements that they use when they're doing their work. I'll talk to you a little bit more about that, but first I want you to know that she is here with Jamel Edwards, and Jamel Edwards is an 18-year-old camp counselor and former camper at Camp Jameson, a camp that works with kids approximately, approximately between ages 8 and 17. Uh, all three of these organizations have been selected for grants that they will be receiving today. We also have the Reverend Michael Robinson, Director of Community Outreach and Hiring at the Temple University's Lenfest North Philadelphia Workforce Initiative. 
We have the Reverend Dr. Duran D. McKinney, Sr., who is a senior pastor at Bright Hope Baptist Church, which is hosting us today. And as you may have noticed, to my left, we have some young people who are being incredibly attentive, one of whom I think brought me a pair of handcuffs, <laughs> which is a toy, and that's the kind of handcuffs we like the best. Um, I was not brought a key, but we can talk about that later, see what we can do about that, and thank you for that. We will be hearing from three of the students who are involved with the Power of Paint Art Academy and Management, where all of these young folks are involved. They are Sabir Johnson, who will be speaking to you at the ripe old age of four. We have Nakira Murray, who will be speaking to you at the age of 12, and Grace Tupich, who will also be speaking at the age of 16. Now let me turn, if I may, to talk about gun violence. Uh, year to date, homicides is 304. As of at, on this day last year, it was 229. That is a 33 percent, excuse me, a 33 percent increase, obviously very concerning. From July the 10th through the 16th, and that's what this data is about, there were eight homicides, there were 33 non-fatal shootings. From July 10th through 16th, there were 186 gun or gun violence incidents, 82 arrests were made by law enforcement, and of those 69 cases, were opened by the DA's offices or charged so far. Obviously, many of those cases are still under investigation and may be charged later. The median bail set for illegal possession of guns, $100,000. The median bail set for violent offenses committed with guns is actually a little better than it's been. It's $262,500. Uh, not the million dollars, minus one, that we seek routinely for violent offenses involving guns, not the million dollars that we seek for most possession of gun offenses. But that number, $262,500, does suggest there's a little bit of progress uh, in asking bail commissioners to impose bails that get closer to detaining people who present a serious risk of harm to the community before their trials. Over this weekend, we had a number of terrible shootings. On Thursday night at about 11.30 p.m., there was a triple shooting on the 1800 block of West Susquehanna Avenue, Avenue in the 22nd Police District. Victims included a 26-year-old black male, a 14-year-old black female, and a 24-year-old black male. All the victims were transported to Temple Hospital, where the 26-year-old was pronounced. This remains an ongoing investigation. No arrest has been made by PPD at this time. PPD is the Philadelphia Police Department. Anyone with information related to this incident should contact Philadelphia Police Department's Homicide Unit at 215-686-3334. On Friday evening, at about 8.30 p.m., five individuals were shot on the 2700 block of Ruby Terrace in the 12th Police District. Victims included a 38-year-old black male, 29-year-old black male, 14-year-old black female, a 33-year-old black male, and a 31-year-old black male. The victims were all transported to Penn Presbyterian, where the 31-year-old black male was pronounced. Anyone with information should contact the PPD's homicide unit at 215-686-3334. It's an ongoing investigation. On Saturday evening at about 8 p.m., an approximately one-year-old child was shot one time in his left leg at 50th and Haverford. Excuse me. He was taken to CHOP and placed in stable condition. In addition, a 26-year-old black male was shot once in his forearm and was transported by private vehicle to Penn Presbyterian. Once again, this is an active investigation. Anyone with information should reach out to Southwest Detective Division at 215-686-3184. About 45 minutes later, and just blocks away on Saturday evening, at about 8.45, there was a double shooting on the 1400 block of North 22nd in the 22nd Police District, and approximately 17-year-old black male was shot once in the right hand. 19-year-old was shot twice in the left arm. Both were transported to Temple Hospital by private vehicle and were placed in stable condition. No arrest has been made related to the incident. Once again, anyone with information should contact Central Detectives at 
3094. I'm sorry it keeps going on, but it just keeps going on. On Sunday night at approximately 11.15 p.m., there was a triple shooting on the 100 block of North Peach Street in the 19th Police District. An 18-year-old black male was shot one time in the left leg. An approximately 16-year-old black male was shot once in the rear, and an approximately 17-year-old black male was shot once in the right wrist. All three victims were taken to Penn Presbyterian, placed in stable. Like the other shootings, this one is not solved. Anyone with information related to the incident should contact Southwest Detective Division at 215-686-3184. I want to make sure we are very clear about this. Our office has a remarkably high rate of conviction of people who are caught for engaging in shootings or homicide by shooting. We take pride in that. We will continue to make sure the quality of our prosecution is as high as it can possibly be given the quality of the investigation that we receive. And we understand these cases are not always easy to solve. But if you are a shooter or self-identify with a violent group that is driving gun violence in the city, you will be held accountable by my office. No mother, no child, no family should live in fear in their community. I also want to be clear that there is help to members of the community, to the families of people who've been shot or have been killed. That is through our CARES unit. And the number for that is 215-686-8019. For anyone who is willing to provide information but for some reason is unwilling to do it to the Philadelphia Police Department, you have only to contact the homicide unit of the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office. We have made a point of being clear how serious we are about the system being accurate and fair. We cannot have a situation where people are afraid to come forward when they have information about serious and terrible crimes. Yes, we will talk to you if you are, for any reason, unwilling to speak directly to PPD, and we will make sure that you are heard and that you are treated in a way that is just and fair. And now, I would like to turn to people who are preventing shootings, who are preventing violence, who are preventing crime, and who are doing it, in many instances, out of their own pocket with their own time. We have three grant recipients today. I'd like to bring them up one at a time, and I'd much rather they explain to you themselves what they do, because the work is remarkable. The work is varied. The work, uh, in many instances, is extremely creative. But I do want to do this. I want to let you know, before they speak and before they explain the work that they do and before they receive a symbolic check, we have the real checks too, but they're smaller so you can fit them into an ATM machine or take them to a bank. Um, I do want to let you know the slogans, the phrases, the mantras that they use all the time in their work. The first organization, please don't come up yet, I'll call you up in a minute, is Power of Paint Art Academy and Management. That is the organization that has uh, so many young folks here with them, gives you some idea of how popular they are. And they have a phrase, and that phrase is be powerful. Once again, the name of the organization is Power of Paint Art Academy and Management, be powerful. The second organization is is Sucor. Sucor has a phrase, and that phrase is keep on keeping on. Be resilient. I think when they explain to you what they do and for whom they do it, that phrase will make some sense. And then there is Camp Jameson. And the phrase that I was told today by Jamel Edwards, a camp counselor there, young man right over here, is camp is a camp for everyone. And I believe you'll be able to find out why very shortly. So I'm just going to state the obvious one more time, which is that prevention is a key to how we stop another generation from young pe of young people from picking up a gun, another generation of young people from being on one end of the gun or the other. We are delighted that these organizations have done everything they could without any assistance from the DA's office, but we are also delighted to be able to support them with grants. And now I'd like to call forward first the Power of Paint Academy and Management specifically. I'd like to call forward co-founders Vanessa Young and Tisha Brown uh, and anyone else that they choose to call forward with them.
My name is Vanessa Young, and I am the founder of Power of Paint Art Academy. Tisha and I founded Power of Paint Art Academy and Management about four years ago, and it was because we seen a need for uh, organization in our communities that could teach kids about self-esteem and loving themselves and compassion for others, but also skills and art that could eventually lead them to become entrepreneurs and empower them financially as well. In the past three years, we've serviced about, I would say about 3,000 kids, most of which who we dropped off supplies to their doorstep so they could paint on Zoom with us three times a week for free. We've also piloted programs that uh, have VR, virtual reality, uh, where kids can learn how to fish or garden without ever leaving their home. Um, it also encourages socio-emotional socio skills amongst one another when children from different neighborhoods and cities get to meet one another prior to conflict. That way they see the humanity in one another and they're less likely to resolve conflict that they might have with violence. Um, a lot of the, I, I have about 20 kids here with me today, and 40% of them have had are direct victims of gun violence, um, all of which lost dads or, or moms to something involving gun violence. And that is a horrifying statistic when you got kids that are four and eight that don't know their parents. So it's, it's very likely that they will grow up with less love and compassion to be able to give others. And that's how the cycle of gun violence and violence in general repeats itself because we don't have positive role models oftentimes outside of our families to just step in and say, hey, I love you, slow down. Let's, let's develop this safe space and see what we could do to make things better. A lot of people have this feeling of diffused responsibility in Philadelphia where it's like, oh, it's not my child, I don't care. Tisha and I have no children. Um, and we've invested thousands of dollars for other people's kids just because we see that there is a problem going on in, in streets where, where children, Larry said that a baby got shot the other day. And I don't see any situation that, you know, justifies a baby getting shot. So Tisha and I have committed ourselves to developing programs like uh, conflict resolution programs, uh, what, Creative writing, we do mindfulness. Um, a lot of our programs are mindfulness based. We just launched a bike in um, Black Girls Bike, so we could incorporate some physical aspects to that as well. Um, we're doing coding. We're doing a lot of things that children can get to, you know, to be exposed to, to see that there are options within the arts, but also have a place where they can talk about what's happening, where it's a safe space to talk about grief and trauma and loss and, you know, develop these self-esteem. So that is, that is why we do what we do. We were the recipients of a targeted invest, a targeted community investment grant. We got about $15,000. Of that $15,000, we took kids to go race car driving, to go, uh, to go swimming, camping, we taught, taught them archery, we bought them all bikes, their own personal bikes. So I can honestly attest to those type of investments, what they do to organizations like ours, they empower us to, to be able to give kids exactly what they need. And, and it's, it's, it's more beneficial that way because we know exactly what these kids need because we're there with them every day. I, uh, and apart from being there with them every day, I'm one of those people who grew up in an inner city, inner city community, and uh, I've I've had a gun pulled on me. You know, I've 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 committed crimes, I've sold drugs, but I changed my life so that I could better impact other people. I think if more people like myself or Tisha or some of the leaders that are in this room just step up and be honest about you know what we've all been through and how we could better impact the future, there would be great change made in Philadelphia. Thank you. Uh, I go to Power Paint Academy. Um, they did a lot for me. I have grew out of my shell, um, and it's really improved my social skills a lot than I used to be. 
and it's really impacted on my life and that's something that they obviously want to carry out and do more for other kids and it's and it's good they deliver packages to my door set um, we do paint online in zoom and we have one-on-ones which is really good because that moves my social skills out of my own boundaries and what I used to be like and it's really made an impact on my life I've been a part of Pal of Paint for a few weeks now, and like Nakira said, um, it really brought out how I had to take the leadership in myself and bring that out, because I've always had the capability, but uh, Vanessa and Tisha showed me that um, I don't have to like stay in a shell all the time, I've got to like get out of my comfort zone. And seeing two black women in power, uh, business owners at that, it makes me think, I can grow up to be something. I don't have to just be an employee to work somebody. I can have my own business. And also seeing all the kids here, seeing how they're growing just in a few weeks and how invested they are in art, it's like black children do have a future. And I don't have to worry about them being like running in the street, all of that, because we have a community for them. We have a place for them to come, a place for them to outlet all of their feelings in art. Thank you. And now I'd like to call forward Malika Bay and Tisha Brown, who are the co-founders of, oh, I'm sorry, I beg your pardon. I'd like to call forward Malika Bay, who is the founder of Secor Incorporated. Uh, she is here with a number of super volunteers, Don Wilkerson, Yolanda Novoa, and Khadija Diggins-Johnson. I'm not sure which of them are going to speak, although I know Malika will speak, but I'd like you to come forward if you would, say a few words, and then... Um, we will be delighted to present the symbolic check. Good morning, everyone. My name is Malika Bay. I am founder of Sucor Incorporated. Um, that is S-U-C-C-O-R. That is an English word, which means sit, assist or help. Sucor is a nonprofit organization that works with families in the city of Philadelphia. Through our program, affectionately known, I'm sorry, excuse me. Through our program, affectionately known as Arlene's Closet, we assist women who are in recovery programs, halfway houses, shelters, and returning citizens every day, providing necessities and resources annually. And we also provide their children with school supplies, new clothing, diapers, toys, and toiletries. Although women and girls are at the forefront of our services, we also offer supplies to, and services to men also. Due to COVID-19 safety restrictions, Sucor Incorporated closed its physical location in March of 2020. We changed the distribution process and, pro and product outreach service. We created grab and go events to continue the service to the Philadelphia community which with much needed supplies. 
we we are definitely um, we pray that we will be able to provide our mentoring programs and our workshops again soon. We are extremely grateful for this blessing that we are receiving today. We intend to use this donation to help us with our new model of care, the best meet ever changing needs of the families and the communities that we serve. If anyone in the community would like to contact us for service, volunteer with us, or make a donation, we can be reached at 267 930-8057. We also are on Facebook. We are on Instagram at Sucor, S-U-C-C-O-R, in Inc. I-N-C 2007, which is on Instagram. We also have a GoFundMe page where we're always looking for donations so that we could be able to continue our work. I am here today. We have many volunteers all across the city who come out. They've been working tirelessly through the pandemic. Um, as I stated, we have a grab and go events where we are working, doing a lot of work. We, uh, Logan Elementary School assists us by allowing us their schoolyard to host our events where we would have space to basically social distance and be able to give um, product to many families. We service thousands of families a year. Um, we also want to give a special thank you to Cradles to Crayons who kept our doors open um, by providing us with a lot of a lot of product product this year, which we were able to keep our doors and our services open to the community. Uh, we also would like to thank the Nomo Foundation, who also, when it got cold outside, too cold for us to be on the, in the schoolyard. No More Foundation opened our, their doors to us a few months back and uh, when it was cold and allowed us to come into their facility and be able to service to community. So we want to give a special thank to many of our community partners. We want to give a shout out to Ms. Victoria Gins, who is, also, who is the president of our organization. Her last name is G-I-N-N-S. Victoria and I started this organization back in 2007. I would like again to thank all our volunteers, too many to name, you know who you are. Um, I want to, we, right now I have Ms. Yolanda Naboa, I have the Khadija Diggins Johnson, and Ms. Dawn Wilkerson, who have been volunteers with us uh, basically since we started. And um, would you like to say yes. something? Hi, my name is Yolanda Naboa. I am a psychotherapist for mental health outpatient. I'm also certified in trauma and PTSD. I volunteer my services with Malika because I respect her one as a person. I respect what she's doing for the community. And it's about saving our youth. A lot of our youth have been traumatized um, just from the mere fact of the shooting, of growing up in single households. And I believe that is very important for all of us to be involved because it does take a village. In order for us to sustain our community and be resilient, be empowered, I think it's very important we as a village all give back. And I just want to say thank you and thank you to Malika. Um, hi, I'm Khadija Diggins Johnson. I'm the secretary of Secor Incorporated. Um, I just can't, I just want to say I can't wait to actually get back in person. Um, the best thing about this program to me is seeing mothers come in that are b trying to get themselves back out into the world with, um, and dressing them for an interview and to see the smile on their face when we put them in a whole new outfit, jewelry, shoes, a suit, and have them ready and smiling and ready to get back out into the world to take care of their family is one of the best things to me with this um, organization. Um, thanks to my mom. I learned from the best, I'm just saying, <laughs> but thank you. So again, I wanna thank the DA's office, um, Mr. Krasner for presenting us with this money and we will, we are very thankful and we um, are blessed. And anyone else who would like to give us a donation so we can continue our work, <laughs> Please, you can go on at Sucor Incorporated on GoFundMe. Yeah, we Thank need you. some more volunteers. We can always use volunteers.
count of three, we're going to go with keep on keeping on, right? Ready? One, two, three. Keep on keeping on. <laughs> All right, thank you so much for that. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our third and final recipient for today. And that is Jacqueline McDonough, founder and executive director of Camp Jameson. She is here with Jamel Edwards, who is a camp counselor. He's a former camper. Uh, when, when young people hit age 18, it's time to be a counselor uh, rather than a camper. But we are delighted that they are here. and. Uh, it, they'll have some very interesting things to say about how the camp was founded, why it's called Camp Jameson, how many kids are served, and how a bunch of educators came up with an idea a while ago and have somehow been managing to raise the funds on their own until now. We're delighted to be part of supporting their organization. Would you come forward, please? Thank you to the District Attorney, uh, Larry Krasner, the City of Philadelphia, and the Philadelphia Foundation for this award to Camp Jamison. I'd also like to thank Nicole Shirk and our entire Camp Jamison family and all of the parents who have entrusted us with their children over the years who believed in a community that summer camp could change lives. I'm Jacqueline McDonough, the Executive Director and Founder of Camp Jamison, and at Camp Jamison we believe in the power of summer camp and that every child should get the chance to go to overnight summer camp no matter how much they can pay. I founded Camp Jamison in 2005 uh, because in 2005 the camp I attended for in Philadelphia as a child and worked at was closed and that's also the first year that I buried a friend to gun violence. At only 19 it cemented in me that summer camp meant safety in so many more ways than I had ever known before for Philly kids. In 2011, we held our first session of Camp Jameson with nine campers run entirely by full-time educators. We are still an all-volunteer organization run by educators and other caring full-time employees. It's been a slow and steady progress, and this $10,000 will literally pay for the invoices for the bus that should just be getting to my email um, for the 60 uh, children that we took up and back to the Pocono Environmental Education Summer, which shares that we use as our summer camp campus. It also means breathing room for the first time since we fa were founded in 2011. The statistics that were said earlier from uh, District Attorney Krasner all happened while our campers were in cabins and yurts in the middle of a national park playing and hiking and having fun, which is where children should be. Camp Jamison has been able to give that for one week because of the dedication of our volunteers and the support of people who have donated to us. But our children in Philadelphia deserve an eight-week program, and which requires a lot more money. And that's all they ask me for is more time at camp. And so $10,000 is the greatest thing that has ever happened to us but eight weeks of camp would be the greatest thing that ever happened to Philadelphia kids. Because while they are thinking we are just having fun, we are practicing communication, team building, leadership, patience, and most importantly, peace building. At Camp Jamison, we are nonviolent in word and action. I have Jamel with me here, who I knew um, when his mom found us on the internet and trusted us, who needed a place for her son to go when he was 10. And he has come back every summer since he was 18 now. And this is Jamel. He has been a camper, a CIT, and he just had the hardest week of his life as a, camp, a counselor to his own cabin of kids, which was one of my sons. Um, and so I'm going to let Jamel talk more about the power of summer camp. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Jamel Edwards. Uh, I've been going to camp for as, about, as long as I can remember now. Um, I definitely owe the world to Ms. Jacqueline for showing me another world outside of my city where it's so, been so much chaos and just violence. Um, she showed me a world that just felt free and it helped me learn and strive as a black man growing up in Philadelphia, not even Philadelphia, as um. 
a black man growing up in America, and to her, I owe everything. Um, she's taught me leadership, how to care for others, and really to just keep going when everything gets hard, especially in my city. Um, I've gone back like every year now. It's been a fun experience learning the, the kids who attend there, caring for them, and the activities that go along in the camp. Um, like I said, she's given a safe haven to me and my friends who attend the camp. Uh, she's just all around an amazing woman, and I know how much this camp means to her. She takes it very seriously. Uh, she even entrusted me with her son uh, for camp as my first year as a counselor. <laughs> all the kids there, man, they're, they're really great and energetic, and I feel like this camp is a way, an amazing way to get kids um, out of the city and experience a new land and a new world where they can have fun, learn new things, meet new people. And that's, that's like everything uh, for a young child. And again, thank you to Ms. Jacqueline for everything she's done. Almost done and ready to move on to questions if there are any. But before then, uh, we will be hearing from two people who require no introduction, but I'll give them a quick one. We have the Reverend Michael Robinson, who is the Director of Community Outreach and Hiring for Temple University's Lenfest North Philadelphia Workforce Initiative. And then speaking after Reverend Robinson will be Reverend Dr. Duran D. McKinney Sr., who is the senior pastor at our host here, the Bright Hope Baptist Church. Um, I will not introduce each of you in order. If you would come forward one after the other, Reverend Robinson. Let's applaud the district attorney's office for their community support. <laughs> what can we do about the violence and gun violence in Philadelphia? One of the effective tools in the solution toolbox is to thwart this, this issue of gun violence and violence is employment. We know, according to Harvard University's work crime relationship analysis, that employment reduces crime by offering routines, income, and supervision. It also provides, employment also provides um, a deterrent to crime because employed people have more to lose if they are arrested. Unemployment, on the other hand, may lead to increases in crime when people stop working. They lose the positive routines and the supervision that jobs provide. Temple University employs approximately over 8,000 people. And of that workforce, 10% are hired specifically from the North Philadelphia Corridor, which translates to over $50 million of earned cumulative income uh, to the North Philadelphia residents. Uh, North Philadelphia, as you know, is probably one of the hardest hit areas when it comes to gun violence and violence in the community. Temple University offers a variety of workforce initiatives, continuing education programs, and youth and career training programs to help young adults and adults prepare for workforce success. A few of those programs include the Temple University Lenfest North Philadelphia Workforce Initiatives. We do job fairs. We provide individual career coaching, and we provide workforce seminars all free. The Pan-African Studies Community Education Program, PASAP at Temple, offers an array of non-credit courses that people can take that are low cost. The Center for Social Policy and Community Development, they have an array of programs that deal with reducing violence 
um, in the community through workforce programs such as Youth Employment Project, Work Ready Program, Community Health Workers Program, and Adult Basic Education. And then we have the Center for Bioethics and Urban Health and Policy and Research, and they have a dedicated staff and dedicated programs that are dedicated to reducing violence and gun violence in the city. For more information about what we're doing at Temple University, to partner with the district attorney's office uh, through their workforce programs that they have traveling throughout the city, give us a call at 215-204-0677, 215-204-0677. Thank you so much. And again, we applaud the district attorney's office for the great work that they're doing in the community. Thank you. Good afternoon. The data is damning. You've heard the passionate plea from our district attorney in regards with gun violence, violence that has changed the trajectory of our great city. I stand today in solidarity with the district attorney's office. Evan Baylor, one who was connected in so many regards to Bright Hope Baptist Church, was tragically gunned down not so long ago. At the funeral, his mother just wailed, father wailed in so much pain, it took the energy out of the room. Something has to happen. District Attorney Krasner has implemented a strategic plan in counteracting the violence that plagues our community. And in doing so, has put capital to ensure that we have the tangible means as a community to make sure that we're doing our due diligence in ensuring that the violence is quelled. Here at Bright Hope Baptist Church, because of these violence, violent acts that has happened in our community, we have reinstituted our youth outreach opportunities, avenues of hope, that happens every Saturday from 8.30 to 12.30 here, targeting children from 7 to 18, bringing them to a safe haven so that they could excel academically, professionally, socially, and et cetera. Bright Hope Baptist Church has always been the social engineer in arm to create creative solutions on how we can navigate uh, socially and politically here in our great city and beyond. I've had the opportunity to now serve in, in this capacity of pastor for four years. When I was informed by uh, Pastor G. Lamar Stewart about hosting a weekly press conference, I said, by all means. Bright Hope has always been that place that creative solutions are wrestled with and we're able to move forward in a manner that brings glory and honor to God. Beyond the press conference, D.A. Krasner, I would offer Bright Hope as a North Philadelphia hub that if you need anything to ensure that we're doing from a faith community perspective our job to quell the violence in North Philly and beyond, our doors are always open to you. We know that it takes a team to bring matters of such to resolve. So thank you, sir. Uh, know that you're not in this fight by yourself. Uh, Moses was successful because he had two persons, Aaron and Ur, who were holding up his arms in the battle. And I want you to know, D.A. Krasner, that you're not in this by yourself. You have some people of like mind who are behind you to hold up your arms. Know that if there's anything that we can do as Bright Hope Baptist Church, our doors are open. Thank you. All right, thank you all so much for those encouraging, interesting comments that you have. They are truly appreciated. Your being here is truly appreciated, and what you do is truly appreciated. Um, I want to be clear that we are not done giving out grants for any 501c3 
that is interested in applying for these or maybe a grant that's quite different, but grants that work in the community in ways that cause prevention and that in the long run are going to reduce gun violence and make us safer. For any group like that, all you need to do is to email grantmakingservices at philafound, P-H-I-L-A, F-O-U-N-D dot org. That will put you in touch with the Philadelphia Foundation, which accepts these short applications, vets candidates, and makes recommendations to the DA's office, and then we make our decisions. I am looking forward to being able to put more money out as an investment in community-based organizations that are nonprofit shortly after Labor Day. And so that means we need those applications as soon as possible. As we start up with a new year, hopefully a year when our students can be in class, there will be new needs, there will be different needs, but more than anything, we need community to work together with us. We all need to work together to do what we can to reduce gun violence. Are there any questions for anyone who is here? Yes. Uh, you talked about how these are investments in the long term, um, but you also rattled off a lot of shootings from mm -hmm. this weekend. Yeah. Is there anything that you can point to that gives you an indication that anything is slowing down or that this is not going to just continue to happen every weekend? Well, I can tell you this. Um, I can tell you that we are seeing things I find encouraging, but I would be misleading you if I told you the statistics are clear. So, for example, in the last week we saw eight homicides over a period of seven days. That's actually a little bit less than we, than we have been experiencing. We've been experiencing since the pandemic began a pretty steady rate of about 1.5 homicides per day. So over seven days, that's ordinarily 10 and a half. I could point to that eight and say, well, that's two and a half better than usual, but I would be misleading you if I were to tell you that looking at one week, you can tell anything. We can't tell anything from one week. I think what we certainly can say, though, is we are seeing society start to reopen. We are talking about a school year coming when we are hopeful that people will be in classes. And that means that a lot of the programming that goes with school is at least possible. So we're talking about organized sports. We're talking about after school activities of many different types. We're talking about the availability of daycare, the capacity for people to work, the capacity to normalize incomes. We're seeing a lot of indications that society will reopen. And we have every reason to believe that as society reopens, we will start to see some reductions in what we have seen. Uh, that is not just my opinion. That is essentially the opinion of every uh, respected criminologist in the United States. But, you know, obviously a lot of us were surprised that we saw such a sharp spike in gun violence at the same time as we saw a reduction in crime and even a slight reduction in violent crime around the country. So we have been surprised before. The most honest thing that I can tell you is that we have every reason to believe that as society opens up, Things will get better, but we are also all at a unique moment. This is an anomalous moment in the history of this country and in our lifetimes. And so we, we have to be honest that um, while anything is possible, it is my belief that we should be hopeful as society starts to open up. Yes, please. You talked about the situation with bail commissioners improving, but we're still seeing captains, black captains, people in the community saying people that are arrested, repeat violent offenders, gun offenders that are arrested going right back on the street. What can we do to improve bail? Well, let us be clear, bail is set by judges. It is not set by the DA's mm -hmm. office. It has never been set by the DA's office. It's not set by defense attorneys. Bail is set by judges, and it is set by bail commissioners who are, uh, you know, in some instances, not even lawyers, but they get to serve as judges for the purpose of setting bail. We have, since March of last year, so we're now talking 16 months, for 16 months, we have had a very consistent pattern of seeking $1 less than a million dollars bail on essentially every shooting case, unless it was a homicide, in which case we sought for them to be held without bail because the law permits that. That's what we've done for 16 months. And yet what we see is an improvement at this point where the average bail for a shooting gun violence case is at 262000 now that might sound like a lot of money, but just a quick refresher here, you only got to pay 10%. So now we're down to 26 thousand uh, and change. And if you go to a bail bondsman, you only have to pay a third of that. So even at this improvement over what we saw before, which was often $150,000, something like that, even at this improvement, it's only taking about $8,000 
for a person who can get a bail bondsman or bail bonds person, I should say, it's only taking about eight grand to get out. No, it's not good enough. What we need is to get rid of cash bail completely. And we need the Pennsylvania legislature to do that because then we could have a system where judges are saying this one is held until trial period. I don't care how much resources he has, how much he can pay, he's held. And this other approximately 88% are going to get out of custody without having to pay any money because the offenses in which they're involved and their records suggest they're not a danger to the community. That's what they've had for 30 years in D.C. It works just fine. That's what they've had in New Jersey and Kentucky and most recently in Illinois. It works really well. That is what we need. But until then, my office is going to be begging a bunch of judges and a bunch of bail commissioners to do something they're not used to doing, which is applying high bails to hold people who present a danger to the community in custody. I cannot disagree with people in the community who feel that way. I feel that way. They've got a point. But until we have a Pennsylvania legislature that's actually willing to do sensible things about criminal justice, like regulate firearms, which they are not willing to do, and get rid of cash bail, which they are not willing to do, then we are going to deal with the consequences. And my office can only do so much in terms of trying to get the system to change. Having said that, I'm glad to see the number moved a little. I'm glad to see we're looking at 262.5 instead of looking at 150, because it would suggest that maybe after more than a year of talking about this, some of them are starting to listen. Yes, sir. Uh, you became a little emotional speaking about that one-year-old child. Can you talk about what impact these types of shootings have on you? There's been nine children I counted shot since Friday. And, and any updates you can give to any recent shootings? I think um, everybody in Philadelphia is impacted. I'm a Philadelphian. I think we're all impacted by the... impacted by the injustice of children suffering wounds, children who've done nothing to deserve any of it, being placed in harm's way. It is an indictment of where our society has gotten, the policies that we have pursued, the way we have moved forward, because this stuff does not happen in too many other countries. They don't flood the entire population with more guns than people. They don't have a situation in which somehow prosperous people get rich during a pandemic and poor people get crushed. They don't have some of the history of systemic racism in the fourth most segregated city in the United States. They don't have the complete failure of lock them all up and hang them all high, which we have. So they haven't been squandering resources that could have gone for things like these camps or these kids. They've been squandering those resources to keep homeless people in jail for stealing food. And that's the truth. So um, I think it affects all of us. And um, if it ever stops affecting us, then that's, I guess, when we should get worried. Have you had any success with, um, you offered, if people don't feel comfortable talking to uh, Philadelphia police, that they should not see your office they have information about the mass shootings. Have you had any success with that? Have, have people come to you with information that's, that's been helpful? No, I'm, you know, I, I want to, I don't want to reveal anything that might encourage, encourage people to, um, you know, watch who's coming in and out of the DA's office, that might encourage people who are trying to discourage witnesses from doing anything. What I will say, though, is that our door is open. This is not an either-or situation for us. We would rather see everyone go to the police directly. It's the most direct connection to the agency that is primary on these investigations. But we would be negligent in our duty to seek justice if we didn't say, hey, listen, if you're just unwilling to go there for whatever reason, come to us, and we will, we'll take your information. We'll make sure that your information is used for the purpose of investigation and that you're treated fairly by the system. Um, I can tell you the experience in other cities has been yes, that they have found, uh, and I'm speaking specifically of Chicago, 
that they have found that there are some people in the community more comfortable speaking to people in a progressive district attorney's office than they were comfortable speaking to the Chicago police. So it is something that, uh, while I won't comment on specifically with reference to Philadelphia, I think it's something that we should be offering. Are there any other questions? Any updates to any of those recent shootings? Jesse, did you want to answer that? So I can't give a lot of specific information, but I think it would make sense, especially given that we are surrounded by so many children here today, that, as you pointed out, there were numerous children shot uh, over the past week. And, and, and I want to just make it very clear to all the members of the community that are listening here today, people have information about all of these shootings. We have a 14-year-old girl who was shot in her home by a bullet that came through the window, had nothing to do with her. We had another 14-year-old girl who was helping a family member take groceries out of a car. There was a barbecue next door. A whole group of people were shot up, including her. They were not the intended targets. We have the one-year-old who just happens to be with uh, the mother in a convenience store when bullets are flying. The neighborhoods know who did these shootings. It is clear. You have to help the police help you. So in all of these cases, I ask that you call the Homicide Detective Division at 215-686-3334. You can call as a tip. You can call and be willing to go in and go on paper. You can call and go on video. You could call and just give information that might be helpful in their leads. Um, but it is imperative. As of right now, in the shooting of the one-year-old, the update I can give you is an arrest was made, but it's not of one of the shooters who were the initial shooters. It's of another person who returned fire from within the store who possessed their firearm illegally, so they aren't the person who actually shot the one-year-old. Um, but we do not ha I don't have any updates as to other arrests in the, in the cases that Mr. Krasner mentioned earlier. Is there video in that case? Which, I'm sorry, in which case? Uh, there is video. I have not personally reviewed it, so I can't speak to sort of the quality of it at this point. So. The 14-year-old shot um, sitting on her porch Friday, any update to that? Do you, do you know who her suspect is? Uh, um, I, I can't give that information. I also want to say I know some of the initial information was shot on the porch. The information that I've been given most recently is that she was actually in her home. Um, there's a bullet that went through a window. So there's a little bit of conflicting accounts of that, but it's our belief based on what we're seeing, the crime scene, that she was in fact indoors at the time. Do you know how she's doing? I, I tried to get an update before I came here and I was not able to get one, so I'm sorry I don't have that information. Did you have any update on the one-year-old? Uh, the one-year-old was in stable condition was my understanding all along, so uh, I can't say whether in the hospital or back home now, but uh, I think everyone expects that the child will be okay. Physically. <laughs> All right, I just have a final comment and then we'll conclude unless there's another question. But, um, you know, I, I do want to make sure people understand there are steps that we can take in addition to prevention steps. And they are important steps that have not been taken in the city of Philadelphia. Steps over which I do not have control, but steps that should be taken. One of them is a serious Invest, is investment in a cure violence type program. There's a little bit of that going on. There should have been a lot of that going on for a long time. It's been effective in other locations, far more effective than other grassroots efforts in many ways. The second is that this city, for more than two and a half years, has not been listening. When this office said over and over and over, forensics, forensics, there are things that can be done with DNA right now that could have been done a year ago, two years ago with DNA and can be done right now. There are things that should have, could have been done with cellular telephone technology that help to solve shootings. And we are dealing with a situation where in good times only 20% of shootings are being solved by the Philadelphia police. We are talking about the DA asking for money for the Philadelphia police to have better forensics so they are able to solve more cases because they have the tools they need. That 20% solve rate actually went down during the pandemic for shootings. The rate for homicides lurks around 50%, below, below 50% for most of the pandemic, presents the same issues 
and the money is not huge. The money we're talking about here is about $5 million in the first year, plus there would have to be some space, and about $2 million after. Put that in comparison to a Philadelphia Police Department budget that is on the order of $800 million that has increased by $120 million in the last five years, and nobody can find five, and nobody can find two thereafter to increase the solve rate, to solve the crime at the second shooting instead of having three more that come after it. That is shameful. And this city needs to hear if this city is not going to lead on what can be done in terms of enforcement, then we're just going to have to keep talking about it. We're going to have to keep banging this drum until it breaks. We need real resources for cutting edge forensics. It is a bargain in a city that has upped the police budget by over $120 million and paid record overtime last year, none of which has helped us to improve the solve rate. We need to do this. It is a much more interesting question why there is so much resistance, so much resistance going back two and a half years. It is a much more interesting question. But yes, there are things that could be done right now. They could be enacted right now. We've seen some real progress on prevention. Thank goodness we needed it. We now need to see some real progress on forensics, and we also need to see some real progress in investing in things like cure violence because of their record of success. Can Thank you, you very much. Can you explain what that forensics is specifically, like how that works? I can explain to you part of it, but I'm not going to explain all of it because um, I'm not trying to give a playbook to people who shoot people. Explain it so we can explain short, I mean, the short version is DNA. DNA related to gun violence, and also within phone technology, you can find remarkable things. It's not just communications that have been texted or emails that have been sent. It's also geolocation, timed geolocation. It's also an analysis of the network of contacts and calls and the timing of those calls and the frequency of those calls and how that gets you to other phones because the U.S. Supreme Court requires a warrant to go into cell phones, so the cell phones themselves can sometimes give you the probable cause you need to get into another phone. And if you're talking about groups that are involved in violence against other groups, then fundamentally what you're looking at as an investigator is to prove that there's a group, to prove who's in that group, to prove communications are occurring. If you can actually get the communication because you have a wiretap or because you have a text or because you have an email, that's great, but honestly, just seeing the timing and frequency of those communications can be very, very important, not just in solving cases. Solving cases is great, but this office likes to win them, too. Are we you would, saying there's a, there's a hesitation to use the technology or a hesitation to just spend the money? Um, I am saying that I keep hearing this word overtime over and over and over from John McNesby. I keep hearing overtime, overtime, overtime. Raises overtime, overtime, overtime. You know what I want to hear? I want to hear we want to solve crimes. We want to actually stop crimes. I want to hear that from John McNesby. And don't hold your breath because you're not liable to hear that anytime soon. We have to get down to the business of solving cases accurately, cutting off shootings before there are cycles of retaliation. And that is not in the vocabulary of the current leadership of the FOP. Sadly, it seems not to be in the vocabulary of the leadership of the city of Philadelphia, but we need to get there. And if the only way I can get there after having spoken quietly and then repeatedly, if the only way we can get there is by people who are going to start making phone calls and sending letters and doing petitions and doing marches, if that's what it's going to take to get there, then we need to get there. What about the commissioner? Uh, I think you should ask her that. Well, you just named McNesby, so are you going to name the commissioner? McNesby has almost nothing to do with actual police officers. He's up to some other stuff. Um, I, I'm not going to put words in the mouth of the commissioner. She and I had a meeting very recently. We have frequent meetings. I would strongly encourage you to inquire of the commissioner as to whether she supports $5 million in a first year plus some space and $2 million every year after that to bring about a massive change in our ability to do DNA 
around gun violence. I don't want to speak for her. Perhaps she'll speak for herself and for the city. Are there any other questions? All right, thank you very much.